Hey guys, it's Mario. Back in June, I gave a presentation about easily one of my favorite subjects of all time, which is the North Star. Specifically, I share information relating the North Star to the Star Card, and by extension, the sign of Aquarius. It was for a very limited audience and was hosted by Kalina Lux of the Templus Aquaria community. Up until now, this video has been a Patreon exclusive, but I figure it's time to put it on my main channel and make it widely available. Enjoy. All right, right on. All right, so uh, the North Star in Aquarius. I feel as though the best place to start with this presentation is to talk about what I've been calling the sacred center. And so the way I've been putting it is sacred center is the point which everything comes from and returns to. And in my opinion, this has manifested itself in so many different ways. And in a lot of ways is really the model for all life and is kind of the model for everything that I can see with my own eyes. You know, everything has kind of a, a sacred center sort of component to it. And so if we look at the circumpunct, you'll see that there's a dot right in the middle of a circle. And this shape, this symbol is uh, the symbol for the sun, right? Uh, it's also the symbol for target. And uh, the sacred center would be the dot that's right in the middle. And so it's said when people start looking into center symbolism, that everything comes from the center and returns to the center. And I have yet to find something that really contradicts that personally, symbolically at least. A lot of older ancient artworks that depict a sacred center sort of component. So this would be like Mount Maru, you know, in the middle that ascends to the heavens. And so the sacred center seems to be the place where you can access other realms. And so in a lot of ways, it's a bridge. Here's another depiction. Atlantis, or at least Plato's Atlantis with the concentric rings plays into this sacred center concept as well. And so obviously you can see that there is a temple of sorts in the middle and then everything expands out. When you look at petroglyphs, there's a lot of spirally uh, petroglyphs out there. And to me, this speaks to the sacred center concept. And again, it's uh, the point from which everything is generated or it's the point to which everything goes towards as well. A lot of mazes basically are encoding the sacred center sort of concept as well. And it's really interesting to note, because we'll get into this later, that a lot of mazes have seven layers from outer to inner, or vice versa, from inner to outer. Yggdrasil plays into this sacred center concept as well. There's a lot of different cosmological models that have something along these lines. And so the trunk of the tree would be symbolic of the sacred center. Um, and then you can see uh, kind of like a world mountain right there. And basically, Yggdrasil and the trunk of the tree embodies and encodes uh, what I'm going to be speaking about. And it's also on the front of this cover of a book that I've been reading recently that is really fascinating. It's called At the Center of the World. Polar Symbolism Discovered in Celtic, Norse, and Other Ritualized Landscapes by John Michel. And he gets into a lot of fascinating information. And it's all about this sacred center concept, right? And so he introduced me to a new term called centrography. And so essentially, this is the branch of geography that deals with the location of geographic centers. And I didn't realize this, but there are actually um, centrographers, and this is their job, is to find the center of any given region, essentially. And he makes the case in this book that ancient peoples were really concerned about the central location of their empire, of their country, um, of where their tribe lives. And so they were really, really into the idea of having this designated central location where they can congregate and where they can meet. And also 
um, consider new laws. Um, you know, this was a place where justice was served as well. And basically he goes through all of these different maps and situations throughout history of different kings and emperors and whatnot, uh, locating the sacred center of their region. And so this is just one example on one of the pages in Egypt. And you could see right here at this dot, this was at one point considered the sacred center of Egypt. And so a lot of times these sacred center locations would have a temple or they would have a city that was founded there. And this is where everybody would come and congregate. And it was a very, very significant thing uh, for a lot of different groups throughout history, which I was kind of unaware of until not too long ago, but it fits in with a lot of this North Star symbolism very nicely. And so he was saying in the book that they wanted to identify the central location and they considered um, when they met there to basically uh, come up with new rules that would govern the empire, that they were the assembly of gods around the world tree. Okay. And if this sacred center location was lost, if this axis location was lost, a lot of times this was actually the beginning of the end for a lot of groups. And he goes through several different examples of this where uh, different tribes or clans or um, groups had this uh, sacred center location. And a lot of times they identified it with uh, a mound or they identified it with a tree or a pillar or an obelisk, something to this effect, a rock or a big stone. And as soon as uh, this location was taken over or corrupted somehow, this was like the beginning of the end for their whole entire empire. And so he goes through multiple examples of that. And it's really interesting when we look in the Middle East and in Jerusalem, they're fighting over a sacred center location. You know, they're fighting over the Temple Mount, which is in the heart of Jerusalem, which is in the heart of Israel, which they consider to be the heart of uh, Jewish culture and religion and faith and everything. So this sacred center concepts still exists. So, you know, the sacred center for Islam would be Mecca, right? In Saudi Arabia. And so this idea exists. There's many, many towns and cities that have a sacred center location. Sometimes it's called a foundation stone. Um, we have the concept or the term city center, right? For a reason. And so a lot of these uh, old cities and towns and stuff still have some remnants of this. Uh, I brought it up on one of uh, the live shows I was on, but in the middle of Dublin, they have this gigantic spire, you know, and it's right in the middle of the city. And this would be their sacred center location that was probably established a really, really long time ago, right? Well, the correspondence for me is that, yes, there's physical sacred center locations, and there's a lot of different groups that say that their sacred center location is uh, the origin of humanity. This is another thing that I've come across is multiple groups saying that they know exactly where the origin of humanity is um, and that they have it identified. And in a lot of ways, you know, I don't think that they're wrong. <laughs> I think that they're all right in a lot of ways uh, because there's many of these locations, um, you know, and I think that it's not wrong of them to assume that their culture in a way is at the center of everything personally, you know, the same way, uh, we all kind of have this innate thing where we all have our own personal experience. And so um, it's hard for anybody to walk in my shoes, see things exactly how I see them. They don't have my psychology, et cetera. All that is to say that the sacred center also has a correspondence with you and you as a person and an individual and uh, as a spiritual being. And so there's the physical uh, center in your body, which I would consider the spine. And so we're going to talk a lot about polar symbolism, uh, poles and spears and pillars and things like that. And we have a correspondence uh, in our body, and it would be the spine, which has 33 vertebrae, which I think is really intriguing for a whole host of reasons, right? But when I refer to the sacred center, I always try and keep in mind this correspondence with, yes, we can talk about the center of the earth, we can talk about the center of town or region, uh, but, you know, it really, um, in many ways, comes back to, well us and uh, our spiritual sacred center, our inner journey, if you will. And so here, uh, you know, traditionally, at least there's seven chakras, 
And so seven is going to be coming up quite a bit. And so when we're dealing with the center, wheel symbolism is kind of like a natural parallel to discussing uh, what I want to talk about today. Because the hub of the wheel would be the sacred center, right? And so everything revolves around this pivot point of the wheel. And the spokes emanate from the center. And um, this central pivot point is symbolic of a lot of things that I'll be talking about here very shortly. The zodiac, right, is a wheel itself. And there's a central location with the zodiac. And it's actually the North Star. Um, and here in the middle, you can see that there's this little drawing of a wagon. And so uh, I looked up this word and it means wagon. And when we're talking about the North Star and we're talking about the stars that revolve around the North Star, they've also been compared uh, to a wagon and to a wheel or to a chariot, a bunch of other things, which we'll go over. But even the Zodiac itself has this central spot that's really, really significant in which everything rotates. So here we can see Polaris right in the middle. This is the pole star. And then um, you can see the constellations of the ecliptic around here. And then uh, Ursa Major right here or some minor right here. And so when we're talking about this central pivot point, you know, we have to talk about the phallic symbolism that generally symbolically is associated with it. And so we've got the, the pole or the post, uh, the pillar, the spear, I would say by extension to um, the sword, it kind of just goes on and on and on. And so here you can see symbolically why this uh, axis point, uh, the axis mundi, or uh, where the pole star rests, where Polaris is, why symbolically that would be something phallic that everything revolves around, just like an axle. Here's just another depiction of the night sky around Polaris. Well, it turns out, based on my research, there's a classification of deity or God that has been largely lost. Um, and it is the pole God or the polar God. And so there are deities uh, that are heavily associated with the pole, with the world tree, with this pillar, the central pillar, or what uh, a lot of people call the axis mundi as well, the world axis. And so it turns out, my understanding is that Hermes Mercury is actually one of these deities that is a polar deity. And so when I see this now, when I see the central pole, um, I think of the Axis Mundi, I think of the world tree. And then when I see this little globe up here, I personally think of the pole star. I think of the North star, you know, and there's a lot of depictions, you know, like in uh, ancient Egyptian artwork where you'll see a uh, disc and then there's wings or a snake or something like that. And I'm starting to wonder, and I'm starting to consider the fact that we're not actually looking at a solar object, but we're actually looking at a polar object, which would be the North Star, Polaris. And so here you can see the Magician card. This is the Thoth deck by Crowley. And so down here, you'll see that he corresponds with Mercury, the Magus, right? And he is right in front of this pole. And so this pole, you know, you could easily just overlook it and not notice it. But um, this is a reference to this polar axis world tree trunk that I'm referring to. And also it's number one, too, which is symbolic of that same symbolism. Well, there's a god named Ptah, and he's holding a staff right in front of him. And it's my understanding, this is just my classic example, because this is one of the first deities that I learned this about. And most people, when they look at Ptah, they consider him to be a solar deity. That's my understanding. Um, but one of the books that I read that really kind of shaped and, um, you know, uh, helped me progress through this symbolic sort of uh, journey in terms of how 
significant the North Star is. Uh, that book is called The Star, sorry, The Night of the Gods by John O'Neill. He makes a really good case that Ptah, along with a lot of other deities, is actually a polar deity. He's a polar god. And so that's why he's holding this staff right there. And so when you see different figures like in the tarot or what have you, and they're holding a staff like that, um, to me, it's really symbolic of uh, this axis pole that I'm referring to. And also, this is where uh, we get the Oscar statue from, right? Is Bata. So this is just another example. But when you really look at it symbolically, you know, does he look like a polar deity? Or does he look like a solar deity? And so that's this whole big thing right now um, that I'm really considering and weighing in on is this polar versus solar worship concept and polar versus solar deity thing. It's really fascinating because it, it completely, it's kind of a paradigm shift, if I'm being honest, that uh, a lot of times when I look at mythology now, a lot of people would just associate something with being solar in nature. And I actually kind of see it the opposite now, not every single time, obviously, but a lot of times I'm like, well, actually, this might be polar symbolism, not solar symbolism. Okay, so this is a uh, painting with Pythagoras. And I don't know if you guys have seen it before, but this comes from uh, The Secret Teachings of All Ages by Banley P. Hall. It's a really popular book, very influential book, too. And to me, when I see this now, I just see polar sacred center symbolism all over it. And so as an example, he's holding a pyramid and it's right in front of a pillar. And so to me, that's pretty significant. I don't think that's by mistake. I think that's intentional. And I think that this pillar symbolically is representing the uh, that axis point, that, uh, that world tree, that trunk. And here, even down below, you can see something that kind of looks like a world tree, right? And then to me, the kicker, really, that just kind of makes this uh, even more concrete is the fact that his finger is actually pointing at the dot in the middle of this circle, right? And so um, to me, a lot of ancient cultures understood this concept of the sacred center and what it represents on a world level, on a spiritual level, on a personal level. And I think that they've encoded it in all sorts of different works of art and what have you. And so I think that uh, this is a little nod to that. Um, that's very significant that he would be pointing to that, in my opinion. So when you're dealing or talking about Northern symbolism in the sky, there is this long history of the North Star being the location of the throne of God. And there's heavy god and goddess symbolism that's tied to the North Star and just this area in the night sky in general. So as an example, this is kind of like a classic depiction of God, right? With the white beard and everything else. He's clearly throned. And we see the four cherubim creatures. Sometimes they're referred to as the four faces of God, um, or the uh, tetramorphs, that's another name for these guys, but they really represent the four fixed signs, right? And so the eagle here is symbolic of Scorpio, and then the man is symbolic of Aquarius, and then we've got the bull, which is Taurus, and then we've got the lion, which is Leo. And so he's sitting in the middle of these four creatures, which means that if he was located physically anywhere, it would be at around the North star, it would be at the North, you know, because once again, the ecliptic is a wheel and revolves around the central up. And so, um, so traditionally, uh, a lot of gods, uh, like the Supreme deity is said to be located at the North. And I was really blown away. I actually have a buddy in real life in real life, uh, that really got into Northern symbolism like years and years and years before me. And he pretty much confirmed all of the stuff that I was researching. And it's kind of difficult to come across people who have made this like a serious study. But he essentially said to me that what most people, what most groups consider to be God is really a Northern God. That's where he comes from. And that's what all the symbolism points to, whether they even know it or not. You know, sometimes it's so veiled and so hidden and esoteric that you really have to dig deep to understand that there's actually a location uh, reference for the Supreme Deity. But uh, when you look into it, it's always the North. 
And so I think that's really interesting. But there's also been a lot of goddess symbolism associated with the North and the North Star as well, which uh, Kalina kind of alluded to something like this. But that more than likely, of course, predates, you know, all of these patriarchal gods and what have you. As an example, you know, in my opinion, Santa really is kind of the closest thing we have to like a mainstream pop culture god, if you will. And where does he come from? You know, he comes from the North Pole. He comes from the North, right? And he has the white beard. Um, Northern symbolism has a lot to do uh, with abundance and prosperity. And here this guy from the North Pole is just giving gifts, you know, uh, to these kids all over the world, right? And so there's a lot of Northern symbolism clearly baked into Christmas and you could barely see it here, but there's a little Christmas tree in the bell. And so when I see the Christmas tree now, I really interpret it as a Northern symbol. I, I look at it as the world tree essentially. And when you're putting a star on top of the world tree, you are putting the North star on top of the world tree. So the star on top of the tree is another Northern symbol. Um, and the reason why this is the case is because a lot of groups basically kind of like my quote earlier, you know, believe that we came from the sacred center, which would be the North, the North star would be the correspondence with it and return there. And so it makes sense to me that a lot of our symbolic language, um, a lot of mythology is actually a big reference to all of that. And so uh, if we came from there, it would make sense that there's a lot of different things that we have around us that are basically echoes of uh, where it came from. So speaking of goddess symbolism uh, related to the North, I was fascinated to learn this past Aquarius when I was doing research for the sign that the Virgin Mary has a lot to do with Northern symbolism and specifically the North Star, right? And so this is the North Star above her. She's at the ocean, obviously. And then you could see there's a ship here. Well, this makes perfect sense because the North Star is the guiding star. And so if you're voyaging around the world in a boat, you know, and your instrument instrument <laughs> instrumentation went down or was lost or you couldn't uh, locate where you were if you knew at least where the north star was uh, you could figure things out and so it is the preeminent navigational star uh, in the heavens if you knew where the north star was you knew how to get home so the north star is the guiding star and i believe we're going to get more into the virgin mary later um right we are <laughs> Okay, so uh, when I mention the pole, or I mention the pillar or the post or the tree or whatever, when I mention anything phallic, I just have to say that there is also this relationship, uh, this correspondence with the yoni as well, and the feminine receptive vessel that may receive the phallus. So in actuality, what we're dealing with, honestly, is poles and holes. And so I felt like that was kind of necessary to say in that it's there's not just a pillar at the north, symbolic pillar at the north, but there's also a receptive um, thing there. And so pulls and holes, that's the simplest way I can say it. Well, speaking of the receptivity of the north, uh, there are multiple afterlife um, theories, traditions, what have you, that say that we return to the North upon death, okay? And that there's an actual real life stairway to heaven that exists at the North. And this is actually on the top of a Freemasonic Lodge. And they publicly acknowledge that this is the North Star. So this lodge is in London. And here you can see the zodiac signs around this central star and then you can see a ladder going towards the star because this is symbolic of um of the stairway to heaven essentially and so what i'm also learning too is that a lot of esoteric groups uh what they're teaching you is how to die properly and what happens upon death and so oh, there's a lot of books you know um the Egyptian Book of the Dead, Tibetan Book of the Dead, things like that. 
And I think that a lot of these occult groups are actually teaching members the proper ways to die and what happens upon death. And um, I think it's actually a bigger thing than probably what most people realize. And so here's another angle of this North Star above the lodge, by the way. And so my understanding too is that when they create these lodges, they're basically saying that we are at the center of the universe. And so they're tapping into the sacred center sort of concept. And so they're acknowledging that what they're doing right here is going to reverberate and echo, you know, to the rest of the cosmos. And they're declaring that sacred space. And I think that when you're doing magical rituals, and I even think when you're meditating, you're declaring that sacred space. And so you're declaring that you're at the sacred center. Well, it's really curious because a lot of times when you look at Masonic artwork, the ladder is going towards seven stars, okay? Or sometimes it's a seven-pointed star, which I was just completely fascinated with. And so most people, I think, would have a couple of different assumptions about what these stars represent. But in my opinion, it's actually a northern reference, north star reference as it relates to Ursa Major, which we'll get into. So this is a Masonic tracing board. And so here you can see the ladder going up to the seven-pointed star. And a lot of times, too, it's really fascinating uh, in Masonic tracing boards, you'll see seven lone stars or seven stars around what looks like the moon. But I actually believe sometimes, not all the time, but I think that sometimes it's a veiled reference to Polaris and the seven stars of Ursa Major and Minor. So again, the seven symbolism just comes up time and time and time again. And it's because of the seven stars of uh, the Ursa constellations. And basically, too, by the way, there's work that has come out. Uh, this woman named Judy K. King, um, she has this whole breakdown about, about the Egyptian afterlife process and how they got from being a living being to uh, going to the other side and what that looked like. And she even literally has like the directions of you're going east and you're going here and you're going there and like the step-by-step -step sort of thing that happens when you die. And so I think that when you're looking at these Masonic tracing boards, uh, I'm pretty sure that they're encoding all of that information for you amongst a lot of other things. So once again, the sacred center, the point which everything comes from and returns to, I think that's what the North Star symbolically represents. And there's a lot of other processes that are seven stepped. So I recently talked to a fellow on a live stream and he wrote a paper about the seven alchemical steps of Azoth alchemy. And um, these seven steps have a correspondence with the seven uh, traditional planets. And right here, I have a breakdown of these seven steps. And so there's a Latin uh, name for each step, which creates the acronym vitriol. And the translation, if you just read this as a sentence, is visit the interior parts of the earth. By rectification, thou shalt find the hidden stone. And so uh, there's seven steps to go in inward and to find kind of like your authentic true north or do personal inner alchemy. And then there's seven steps uh, to all sorts of different other alchemical processes. You know, we have seven days of the week, seven colors of the rainbow. Um, you can do look into seven symbolism all day long, but seven really has this uh, cyclical um, patterning associated with it, which is why it's related to the chariot card. So it has to do with time. It has to do with revolution and movements, transformation and things like that. So uh, my, you know, my perception of seven has really changed over the last couple of years because it is a very, very, very powerful number. And even uh, this branch of alchemy, you know, acknowledges as such. There's also stories of seven deities that came from the north. 
So this is Mesopotamian. Uh, when there's all seven of them, they're called the Apkalu, I'm pretty sure. That's my understanding. And so they are the fish-headed deities, but it was said that they came from the north and that they came and uh, bestowed wisdom upon humanity. And they're not the only set of seven sages that are related to the north and to fish symbolism. So these are the seven rishis uh, from the Vedic pantheon. And so there's an eighth person in the back. The front seven are the rishis. And uh, these figures, very much the same sort of idea. They came from the north. They uh, gave uh, humanity information and spiritual teachings and lessons and what have you. And they're associated with the seven stars of Ursa Major. And so this is something that you'll find time and time again, that there's multiple groups that have had various correspondences with the seven stars of Ursa Major. So Ursa Major um, is bigger than Ursa Minor, the great bear and the little bear. Ursa Minor, the uh, tip of its handle is actually Polaris itself. But here you can see this easy way to identify and find Polaris is if you look at Ursa Major and you locate where the vessel portion is and then it kind of makes a straight line for Polaris. And that's what they look like, the great bear and little bear. And then just another depiction of the night sky. And so um, there's multiple groups that have worked with Ursa Major in so many different ways. It's really fascinating. And so this is referred to as the pace of view. And so um, this is an ancient Chinese ritual. Uh, it's an ascension ritual. And so when you start getting into ascension material, a lot of times there's seven steps. A lot of times there's seven layers between this realm and the other realm. And what these guys did here was they actually walked the seven stars of Ursa Major and uh, they had a planetary correspondence with each star. So here you can see clarity of Yang is the moon. And then you go to Venus. Sorry, you go to Mercury, Venus, the sun, Mars, Jupiter, and then finally Saturn, right? And so uh, this is interesting too, because a lot of people think that if you're going to do uh, any kind of ascension ritual, or if you're going to astral travel, or you're going to take off uh, from here astrally that you want to take a pit stop at the moon. I don't know if any of you guys have ever heard that, but as like the closest body towards us, that it's one of the easiest planets to work with and that you don't want to just go straight towards Mars or anything like that, but you actually want to stop at the moon. And so I thought it was interesting that they kind of follow that line of thinking, right. And just go all the way towards Saturn. So Ursa Major has expressed itself many different ways throughout time. It's really fascinating. So this is the Dendera Zodiac, and they saw Ursa Major. So this is Egyptian. Uh, they saw Ursa Major as the thigh of Set or the thigh of the bull, right? And here you can see the thigh right here. I think it's interesting, too, that this figure, uh, Tarawet, she's carrying a knife and she's looking towards the thigh. And so it makes me wonder if she's the reason why uh, this thigh got severed to begin with. I kind of see a little story playing out here. And she's really interesting too. And she's a Northern uh, goddess. Sometimes you'll just see uh, this bull, this bull's thigh, you know, um, in different works of art. It was very significant for a handful of different reasons. Here you can see someone has cut the thigh of the bull, but this is all symbolically referencing Ursa Major. So this is uh, astrotheology, right? And the thigh of the bull and Ursa Major was really significant in a ritual called the opening of the mouth ritual. And so sometimes you'll see somebody carrying the bull's thigh 
Uh, once again, this is symbolic of uh, a Versa Major, the Great Bear. But sometimes they're carrying this little device, this little device called the ads tool. And it looks very, very similar to Ursa Major. And they will put it against the, a pharaoh's mouth. And this is part of their afterlife ritual process. Because once again, Ursa Major and Minor are so close to the north that essentially Ursa Major is a substitute uh, north star, uh, north pole symbol. And so that's why there's so many different variations on um, on what it's represented over the years. But the thing that holds it all together is the fact that um, it's a northern symbol. Kalina, you're raising your hand. Yeah, I just, whenever you had an intermission, but I just wanted to address something that I wanted to share at the very beginning. And I, I just saw it come up in the chat. I know that we all come from all kinds of different beliefs about the shape of the earth or whatever. And I encourage you guys to just really, um, I know the cognitive distance might be coming up for a few of you, but that's such a sweet spot and it's so beautiful. So if you can maybe switch from like resistance to just curiosity and make everything innocent, like a child again, and like, whoa, well, what if, oh my God, that, be, you know, let him take you on this journey and you can go back to your beliefs or whatever they are, um, at the end of it. And at very, you know, at the very minimum, maybe you take it as a metaphor. Um, but I think you'll get a lot of juicy value from it. If you just go with the journey, just for a brief little or moment together. That's I'm not, all. I'm not checking the chat, but what are they saying? I'm curious. No, no, there was just a comment, uh, like, I don't know, maybe 10 mi minutes ago or so, um, that just said, like implied cognitive dissonance, like, oh, wait, but what about this? This doesn't go along with this. So I just, I just know that there's sometimes, um, you know, we are, we are all given different beliefs that suit us and they're all just metaphors for our life. Right. Uh, it doesn't really matter at the end of the day. It just matters your connection to the divine and the journey. I think that they were just, um, like, wait, but what about this? Right. So, but I wanted to say that regardless, I just forgot at the beginning because my connection cut out. So that's all. Don't want to disturb anymore because it's so good. Nice. Right on, right on. That's cool. Yeah. You know what? Um, this was, like I said earlier, coming across a lot of this information and thinking uh, this way has been a complete paradigm shift. And so just like all paradigm shifts, you know, they don't come easy. And it's taken me years to kind of wrap my head around some of this material. And I'm so used to it. And there's people here that I've talked to many times about a lot of this stuff. And so they've heard me kind of like, you know, expound on it. Um, so, but if someone's brand new to some of this stuff, I totally get it and understand. And I'm happy to answer questions after the fact too. Uh, and it sounds as though, or it looks as though we'll have time to definitely do that. Um, right. So the opening of the mouth ritual uh, with the thigh of the bull is definitely a thing. It's an Ursa major reference. There's a whole book that I read uh, that gets into that pretty heavily, but the, the Ursa Major constellation is something that is, I wouldn't say it's exactly universal, but my understanding is that 90% of the world can see Ursa Major, Ursa Minor, and the Pole Star. And so uh, these constellations are circumpolar, meaning that they don't dip below the horizon line. Um, so you can see them depending on where you're at. For most people, they don't dip below the horizon line, especially if you live in the Northern Hemisphere. And so 90% of the world can see these constellations, including China and India and what have you. And so a lot has been made of these constellations over time. And it's because they're circumpolar, because they don't dip below the horizon, uh, they're always present. And so they're always there versus the sun or, uh, you know, the sun comes and goes every single day. Uh, the constellations come and go you don't see certain constellations um you know depending on the time of year obviously but you're always going to see the north star every night you're probably always going to see ursa major and minor every single night and so there is this reliability that has been associated with them uh, which is why they've been so heavily revered and so my understanding is that ursa major and minor um and the north star that this is actually the original sky clock and so um, before astrology, the 12 signs that we currently have now with the ecliptic, um, my understanding is at some point there may have been other sky clocks and there's a conversation to be had there actually. Uh, but my understanding is that they were really closely looking at where Ursa Major was around the North Pole. 
And there's different books that I've read that make a thing of, you know, astral projecting, going to the other side, um, practicing various ascension rituals, um, depending on where Ursa Major was in the sky. And so here you could see this is from the east. Uh, this is Ursa Major on the back of a fan. I think it's really interesting that uh, there is this nice pole right there, which to me is just symbolic of the pole that I've been bringing up this whole entire time. Here you can see another fan, um, but you can see a different configuration of the seven dots. And so the seven dots did not always look like the constellation itself. It didn't always look like a dipper, uh, but it was still symbolic of that constellation. And so here they're making a direct reference to it. But if you obviously, if you haven't done this kind of research, you wouldn't think that that would be the case or what happens a lot of times too is people assume that if you see seven dots or seven stars that it's a reference to the pleiades or it's a reference to the seven traditional planets and my understanding is that actually uh sometimes or perhaps even a lot of times it's a reference to ursa major so this is actually a samurai pole star god and so here you can see the silver star in front of this blue little canopy of, of the heavens here. And so there, once again, is a pole star deity right here. And my understanding is, I believe his name is uh, Miyokin. So uh, I believe this is either the same deity, but a different incarnation. Um, and so you see that, you know, he has this disc behind his head and if you didn't know any better, you would think that this is probably the moon, but in actuality, it's the pole star. So it's acknowledged publicly that this is uh, the North Star. And so that's why he has one, two, three, four, five, six, seven snakes. So once again, the seven symbolism is um, just, you know, completely integrated to uh, this polar research, right? And so here he has the wheel. I was talking about the wheel earlier and the hub of the wheel. And then here uh, he has a sword, right? And to me, this is symbolic of that phallic pole. And so this is a pole star Polaris deity. And so this is a plow from Ireland. And so uh, the plow is also associated with Ursa Major. Um, and so I think it's really fascinating that you can just clearly see the stars outlined here so i believe this flag is called actually the starry plow and then here you can see a knife at the end of it which there's this whole rabbit hole too there's so many other little tiny things that i'm not mentioning uh just because there's like a million threads that go along with this line of research but there's knife symbolism associated with the north as well and even the alaskan flag this is ursa major and the north star right and so um, it's kind of amazing where you see it pop up. It's all over the place once you know what to look for, right? So this is uh, the Gates of the Necronomicon by Simon. I'm not sure if anyone here has gotten interested in the Lovecraftian side of things, Cthulhu and whatnot. But it completely blew my mind when I found out that there are one, there's people who practice Lovecraftian black magic. And two, they are tapping into Northern symbolism. And so here you can see the gates of the Necronomicon and you can see the seven stars of Ursa Major. That's what this whole entire book is about. It's about tapping into Ursa Major and the North Star and basically looking at it like a gateway um, to go to the other side. And so I think it's really, really fascinating that there's a lot of people who talk about various gateways, you know, uh, around uh, space, I guess, you know, and they're saying, oh, well, you know, you can access this gateway at this planet or this gateway at this constellation or this star or what have you at different opportune times. My understanding is that a lot of ancient groups and a lot of occult groups consider the preeminent main gateway to be at the north, right? So if anyone's really interested in uh, Northern symbolism, this book has a surprising amount uh, in here that was very, very valuable for me at least. So it's my understanding that we get the swastika from Ursa Major as well. 
And so when you look at the North Star and you look at Ursa Major, and if you just take a snapshot once a season, so uh, four times a year, you're going to see this rotation of Ursa Major around the North Star. And when you do that, you essentially get a swastika shape. And so uh, th this is my understanding of where the swastika really comes from. I believe this is why um, certain groups and organizations have really wanted to tarnish the swastika and see it that we can never discuss it or talk about it or revere it or anything like that. Um, it's because it encodes and contains a lot of really, really powerful information, right? And this is very much uh, a Western thing because if you go to India as an example, like I have, uh, you're going to see it all over the place and it's not taboo or anything of the sort. In fact, quite the opposite. It really is a lovely shape and a lovely symbol. And uh, you have Northern symbolism uh, to thank for its design, in my opinion. And so even if you notice too, each arm kind of looks like a seven, right? And even if you uh, remove some of these lines, it almost looks like a symbolic seven. And so in my original North Star and Aquarius video, uh, I kind of put forth that we actually get the shape of number seven from Ursa Major. And so here you can see a swastika on a young guy's head. And so to me, this is just beautiful symbolism as well of us being the sacred center and everything revolving around this axis point right here. So, you know, just once again, if people um, aren't aware of the symbolism, I think that you would see a gravestone like this and probably interpret that, you know, it's the Pleiades or the uh, seven stars, or excuse me, seven traditional planets. But in my opinion, I really think that it's an Ursa Major reference. And obviously it being on a gravestone and everything that I've been discussing in regards to the afterlife and everything, I think that makes a lot of sense. And obviously too, with this Ouroboros type shape, you know, we're uh, referring to the cycles of life and death. Once again, uh, another occult symbol that you'll see here in the middle, there's seven stars. I just start looking at these things a bit differently now. Just as I mentioned, most people would consider these seven stars to be the Pleiades, seven sisters, or the seven traditional planets. Um, in the New Age community, there's a lot to be said about the Pleiades. And pretty much, to be honest, what most people say about the Pleiades is everything that I'm saying about Ursa Major, is that this is where we come from, this is where we return to, uh, there's entities from this star system, and they're, um, you know, uh, they basically give us, you know, different tools and ways of looking at, you know, spirituality and what have you. And so I've heard a lot about the Pleiades and people meeting Pleiadians and, you know, what have you. There's a lot to be said about that. Um, but I think it's really fascinating that all of my research with Ursa Major uh, pretty much parallels Pleiadian information. And so I think at some point, I'm just going to put this out there, but I think at some point there was kind of a switch that happened where I think that people understood Ursa Major and its significance. And I think that a lot of that information has then now been channeled or funneled towards the Pleiades. And when you look at the night sky as a holistic system, I think uh, the northern sky with Polaris and all of the uh, dynamics that are kind of built into it with Ursa Major and Minor revolving around the North Star, uh, I think it's a little... Uh, it makes a little bit more sense in my opinion. It's a little bit more holistic. And uh, as far as like a system is concerned, I, I would think that it makes more sense that, you know, if we didn't come from anywhere symbolically and return anywhere symbolically, that it would make more sense that it's Ursa Major than, than the Pleiades. Although there's a lot of lovely things to say <laughs> about that star system and about Taurus and everything else. So um, anyways, but I just had to throw that out there. There's amazing uh, uh, overlapping information when you look at the two. But, you know, Ursa Major and Minor, um, we, most people know them as the dippers, right? So that means that they're vessels, okay? So they're cups. And this is uh, what we'll be getting into now. And so I think it's fascinating that there's so much esoteric, veiled, hidden information 
about uh, these constellations as it relates to the North Star. And even kids, a lot of kids can point out the Big Dipper and Little Dipper. And so um, it's just, it's incredible to me that, you know, as a kid, I remember seeing these constellations where I didn't know any other ones. And then now all of this time later, I'm realizing that there's all of this occult stuff tied to it and really, really powerful information. Um, right. So they clearly look like dippers. And this led me to find all sorts of different, interesting, fascinating correspondences with the star card, because there's a couple of cards where there's twin vessels. You'll notice that the art card, there's twin vessels. And then, of course, the star card, there's also twin vessels. And I would say there's twin vessels, too, in a couple of different ways, symbolically. We have literally the uh, vessels being poured. And then we also have the breasts of this woman, which, which are also vessels, right? And then also notice that there's seven tips to this star and that there's seven stars in the night sky, right? And so when I started looking into the star card, I was just like, wow, it's amazing because I really think that it's the star as in the star of stars, what I call the star of stars, which is Polaris, you know? And so I believe that this is a veiled Polaris reference. And then this is a reference to Ursa Major or Ursa Minor as well, since they both have seven stars. Some esoteric decks have the seven pointed star uh, right here that some people refer to as the Babylon star. And so this is the Lon Milo Duquette deck. And here he has uh, the stars of the Milky Way coming from uh, the breasts of this woman. And so this is definitely a thing in Crowleyan research is that, um, you know, the stars of, of the heavens uh, come from the breasts of a great goddess, which is why our galaxy is called the Milky Way galaxy, right? And here you can see uh, the symbol for Aquarius because the star card corresponds with Aquarius. So this is the Crowley version, the Thoth deck. And so he uses seven pointed stars as well. So it's a bit of a different take. It's not as clear cut as I think some of the traditional cards out there, but there's a seven pointed star right here, a seven pointed star coming out of this chop. And then there's another seven pointed star up in the heavens and they are all rotating. So they're all spinning, right? Which I think is kind of related to this cyclical sort of thing that I've been talking about uh, in regards to the number seven and seven being very much uh, a mover sort of number. And really the star card too, it's one of the most beautiful cards out there. It's very hopeful and symbolic and uh, very positive. And, um, you know, she's nude, so she's vulnerable. You know, this is her true essence. She's not hiding anything here. And uh, one of my friends, Rachel, she shared this with me the other day because she knows my love for all things pole star symbolism related. And I thought this was an amazing star card, really incredible symbolism. So here you have the star and then you literally have the pole that's part of the star. And then she is dancing around the pole. And so uh, I think that's incredible. And so whoever made this, uh, yeah, kudos to them because I think it's really cool. So when we're talking Aquarius, obviously we're talking about uh, two cups or two urns, two vessels that pour water. You'll typically see that uh, water way back in the day for a lot of cultures looked like this zigzag sort of shape, right? Which you can see mirrored in the actual uh, symbol for Aquarius, where it's typically two lines that are kind of zigzaggy, right? One on top of the other. And this is kind of like a fancy version of it. So on the left, uh, you get a little bit of curvy action going on, but a lot of times it's just the simple zigzags. And uh, in my opinion, I really, I, I think that there's something to um, the correspondence between the shape of the symbol for Aquarius and the letters W and the letters M. And so even the words, right, that uh, begin with these letters are very curious and very much in line with Aquarius and the star card and everything else. So this includes words like water, woman, 
or womb or mother, Mary and matrix, right? A lot of times Aquarius though is depicted as a male and he, uh, a lot of times the constellation version of Aquarius uh, in contrast to the star card has one vessel or one urn that they're pouring. And you can see here, I really love this uh, blue drape, right? That's wrapped around him, just symbolic of water and rivers and what have you. But the interesting thing about Aquarius is that it lives in the portion of the night sky that you can consider um, to be the celestial ocean. And so it provides water for a portion of the night sky where a lot of the constellations are oceanic in nature. And so here you have the seagoat, Capricorn, and it's an earth sign, but yet it's a seagoat. So there's this watery connotation to it. So we have Capricorn, the seagoat, and then you have Aquarius, the water bearer, and then you have Pisces, which is the fish. And so all three of these signs have this interesting watery sort of component to it, oceanic component. And then you also got other fish constellations nearby. And then you've got Cetus right here, uh, which is like a sea monster uh, whale sort of thing, depending on uh, the depiction of it. And so Aquarius is the water bearer to this portion of the night sky. And if you're just going to elementally look at the Zodiac and see what, um, what constellations, um, how they're represented, it skews towards water because of this, because of the last three signs of the Zodiac. So like I said, Capricorn is an earth sign, but it's the sea goat. And then you have Aquarius, which is a air sign, but it's the water bearer. And then you have the fish Pisces, which is actually a water sign. And so it provides water for this portion of the night sky. And um, I'm not sure if you guys are aware, but there's also this heavy relationship with Aquarius and uh, the great flood. So the great deluge. And so there's something going on either with the age of Aquarius or the position of Aquarius in the night sky that is related to this great uh, flood that happened however long ago. But I know you guys are aware of that. And then I just threw this in here because I think it's a beautiful depiction <laughs> of Aquarius. I really, really like it. And then I'm going to take a drink of water here. One moment. <clears throat> okay. So there's a conversation to be had regarding the urn of Aquarius or the vessel of Aquarius. I think it's really interesting that um, sat urn, right? It has urn right there at the end of it. And Saturn used to be the traditional correspondence uh, for Aquarius, right? So the urn of Aquarius is really intriguing because, you know, at first glance, upon maybe your first level of research, you know, you're going to come across a lot of watery uh, symbolism in that. Obviously, it's the water bearer, so it just holds water, right? But that is not the end of the conversation, as far as I'm concerned. There's actually a lot more within this container, a lot more potential in this container. So to me, the urn of Aquarius holds, you know, energy and frequency and vibration, ether or spirit, uh, airwaves, if you will, and uh, Amrita, which is the uh, nectar of the gods as well, which we'll be getting into. And so this urn is symbolic of every container, even the great container of the cosmos, right? And so uh, I really look at it like it, it contains all of the things that are necessary for life, you know, including water itself. But uh, this is a more expanded sort of uh, approach or interpretation of the symbolism. And so I think in a lot of ways, the urn of Aquarius essentially is the Holy Grail as well. I think the symbolism just matches up. And so I think we're really talking about the same thing. The Holy Grail or the urn of Aquarius, in my opinion, symbolically are pretty much one and the same. And so here, this is a depiction of the Scarlet Woman. This is by William Blake. Um, she also goes by the name, the Whore of Babylon, right? And so traditionally, symbolically, 
uh, biblically, she's always riding a seven headed beast. So there's our number seven again, right? She's also, uh, you know, exposed. Her breasts are exposed. And so once again, we kind of get the symbolism of the star card as well. And by the way, uh, when my interpretation of tarot is when you're looking at major arcana cards and there's a uh, astrological correspondence. So let's just say, obviously, the star card is uh, a correspondence of Aries, or sorry, Aquarius. I really look at that as you are seeing an emanation of Aquarius. So when you look at the emperor card, you're looking at an emanation of Aries and so on and so forth. And so you're looking at a graphic depiction of that uh, constellation and everything that's encoded with it and what it means. And so I put a lot of stock into you're basically looking at the sign itself, uh, just another expression of it. And so uh, when I recently looked at this artwork during Aquarius, I was like, man, she's the water bearer. She is, she is uh, everything Aquarian, in my opinion. You know, and so she's riding the seven headed beast. So we got the number seven again. And then you could see these souls or spirits are kind of emanating from her chalice, from her cup, from her grill. And they too actually are carrying little grails with them. So I'm not sure if you can see that. Well, it's really interesting when you get into Babylonian symbolism and even the word Babylon. So this is the Babylon star. It's seven pointed and you could see the words or the letters Babylon right here in every single tip. And then you could also see all of the sevens that are going on here. Right. Oh, nice. Um, and so this is from the um, Astrum Argentum or Argentum Astrum. I always get it flipped, but that's what this AA represents. So they're in a cult order. Uh, the Whore of Babylon was a really significant concept and theme um, with Crowley and a lot of people who came after him. And so the Babylon star is kind of a big thing. And so if you ever get into that kind of material, you're definitely going to see it all over the place. Um, but I believe what they're actually encoding is this Northern Gateway symbolism that I've been alluding to. Um, and so it's kind of like in your face, actually, <laughs> once you know the symbolism and uh, how to decode it and everything else between the Yoni in the middle and the sevens everywhere and then Babylon right around it. You know, it all just kind of makes sense to me. And kind of curiously, uh, my girlfriend's reading Hollywood Babylon, and I thought it was kind of interesting that the cover is so booby. And we're talking about all of his breast symbolism with Aquarius and the star card. And then uh, Kenneth Anger is a known occultist. And then you open it up and there's this interesting image here. I wish I knew what year it came from, uh, but there's a seven pointed star right here uh, in the back. And then he also has the quote, every man and woman is a star by Aleister Crowley, right? And so um, the seven pointed star, when you see it out and about, if you're starting to look for it, this is not an easy star to draw. I, I uh, actually encourage anyone to try and draw a seven pointed star. It's not like drawing the five pointed star or the six pointed star. Uh, I'm a graphic designer, so I've been doing it for many, many years. And learning how to draw the seven pointed star is like a skill or a task. So if you see it anywhere, Someone very deliberately wanted it to be seven pointed. It's not a mistake. And so um, anyways, I just thought I would throw this in here because even Hollywood, you know, uh, has acknowledged the star in a lot of different ways. And there's a tradition that kind of corresponds with the star. So this is Polaris, the star of stars. And now we're kind of getting back into some of the Virgin Mary stuff. I think it's really fascinating that we would have the Scarlet Woman and the Whore of Babylon be associated with the seven pointed star and Northern symbolism. And then here also the Virgin Mary as well. So to me, this is kind of like this polarity contrast sort of flip switch kind of thing. And so the Virgin Mary is referred to as Stella Maris, which means Our Lady Star of the Sea. And uh, as I said earlier, it has to do with this star being the guiding star. 
And if you're lost at sea, you can find your way home. And symbolically, she's supposed to be the uh, the guiding star for Christ. And so that's kind of what the church says. So basically, I mean, the church has reappropriated uh, information and traditions and stuff. And I think that what they've done is that they've taken Northern symbolism, goddess stuff that has existed um, before the church. And then they kind of channeled it towards the Virgin Mary uh, in some of these ways. The Virgin Mary is also very much tied to the Vesca Pisces, right? And so uh, that's the shape that's created right here in the middle. It's very much a yoni or a portal or a gateway. And uh, when I think of gateway symbolism now, uh, or yoni symbolism, eye symbolism, I think of uh, reception and projection. So it's not just a one-way street, it's a two-way street. And so this lines up with what I'm saying, the center, um, you know, is where we come from and then return to. So here you can see the Virgin Mary is uh, in a Vesca Pisces almond shape. This is pretty classic. So there's many, many depictions of her in this way, which at its core, symbolically, the shape is a vessel. Just like the vessels of the star card. And so really, when it comes to vessel symbolism with the star card, not only is she holding two vessels, but she also has uh, her breasts, which are vessels. And then uh, she kind of looks a little pregnant here as well, right? And so it looks like maybe um, is going to have a kid. And so she herself, as the divine feminine, is, is a vessel as well. So there's multiple vessel correspondences with this card and um you know i think i think it's lovely i'm a cancer so i like vessel cup <laughs> bowl symbolism as i said earlier uh, i really think that when we're talking about these vessels um it's the holy grail i think the holy grail is something that you know there's a lot of these relics that people are looking for they've always looked for it's you know people have looked for the holy grail the philosopher's stone the spear of destiny, you know, there's all of these different things out there, the Ark of the Covenant, etc. And while some of these, you know, relics might actually exist, I think really I tend to internalize the symbolism for all of these things. And so I tend to associate them with some aspect of myself, you know, so I have an inner holy grail, essentially, you know, we're all vessels of God, I guess you can say, right? Um, and you can use whatever metaphor you want, you know, um, if it's not God, it's source or what have you. But I think it, uh, symbolically, we're all vessels, you know, and we all contain things and we could all bring things forth and what have you. And so when I think of the Holy Grail, I tend to internalize it. But then I also think that there is a symbolic Holy Grail at the north as well. So in India... Aquarius for them is Kumb or Kumba, depending on how you say it. So K-U-M-B-H. And it essentially means water pot, right? And so um, this is the common water pot that you'll see in India. You can see the goddess Ganga, and she's a river goddess, right? And so she's holding two Kumbs or two pots. And the Kumb or Aquarius is actually at the heart of the largest gathering literally in the world, which is called the Kumb Mela. And the whole gathering, basically the, the purpose of it is to take a ritual dip in the holy waters of uh, one of four river locations. And so I have it here. Um, it can attract upwards of 40 to 50 million people a day. So there is no gathering larger on earth. It, the Kumela is it. And uh, it's very, very interesting. I went on a Kumela uh, deep dive rabbit hole thing, and I kind of fell in love with it. It's really, really intriguing. 
And so here they are taking their ritual dip. People from all over India and all over the world come to the Kumela. But it all revolves around the vessel, the Kum or the Holy Grail, in my opinion. And again, this celebration, the Kum, it all aligns with Aquarius. And so the mythology behind the Kumela and how and why it even exists is really intriguing. So if you don't mind, what I'm going to do is I wrote a summary of the Kumela and um, basically its origin story. I'm going to read that to you guys. So it, it'll be maybe three or four minutes or so. In India, Aquarius is called Kum, which means water pot. The Ganges River goddess Ganga can be seen holding a kum or pot, just like Aquarius, the cupbearer. The kum and its associated symbolism is venerated so highly in India, it's the name of the largest gathering in the world, the Kumela, which translates to the celebration of the pot. It can attract upwards of a staggering 40 to 50 million people on its largest day, and the Kumela occurs every three years and rotates between four sacred river locations. That's the really intriguing thing to me, is the fact that it, there's multiple locations. It's not at the same place uh, every single time it happens. Every 12th year, a full-sized event happens and has been called the greatest show on Earth. The dates are chosen astrologically based on the positions of Jupiter, the sun, and the moon. The purpose of the event is to take a holy dip in the sacred river, which is said to purify the soul, absolve sins, and for some is intended to help break the repeating cycles of life and death. The myth states that two sets of demigods, which is what you see here, were tasked to churn the cosmic ocean of milk. So there's this milk reference again, right? They did so by pulling a snake back and forth, which was wrapped around a mountain. This churning of the milk via the mountain produced a sacred nectar of immortality that was contained in a kum and is also called Amrita. The nectar was fought over until Vishnu's eagle flew off with it, but while in flight, four drops of the nectar fell to earth in the sacred river locations acknowledged by the Kumela. What's amazing about the Kumela is how much it personifies all things Aquarian. In several ways, I consider it an outward collective expression of Aquarius and was pleased to see that several of the Kumelas I looked into actually fell within the sign. And that's something I would love to learn more about is how the Kumelas, um, what their relationship is actually with Aquarius. Not only is the celebration uh, centered around water, but the unifying symbol of the pot also represents a gathering of humanity which also speaks to the Aquarian nature. At the Kumela, all walks of Hindu life come together in a way rarely seen anywhere else. This gathering has long been seen as an opportunity for common people to interact with Babas or gurus who sometimes live in remote isolation and are rarely seen. As such, the Kumela is where many people have found their spiritual guides for centuries. So that is one of the biggest parts of this celebration is that so many people come together so all walks of hindu life come together and this is where people find their gurus essentially and this has been going on for centuries upon centuries upon centuries even uh when i was looking into it the lost and found was like uh started in like 1947 or something like that crazy where it's like different aspects of this celebration have been going for such a long time that it kind of blows your mind. There's not, like I said, there's literally nothing else like this on earth. It's the largest gathering in the world. People from all over India and the world come to the Kumela to teach and learn. There's countless discussions, talks, and books available as well, which makes it a tremendous hub of cultural communication and exchange. Uh, so this is another thing that I think is fascinating too. They all come together. And uh, there's so much trade that's going on. It's kind of mind blowing too. Uh, and a lot of information exchange um, in multiple different ways. There are meals available for free of charge. That's the other thing that blows my mind is the fact that there's so many people there and they offer free 
meals, like no questions asked. It's been like this for hundreds of years. There are meals available free of charge and people from all over the world and country come to serve and provide for those in attendance. Without the cooperation of countless individuals and organizations, a gathering of this size simply wouldn't be possible. When I think of the Kumela, it reminds me of the open, eccentric and accepting nature of Aquarius. The river and pot symbolism is clearly Aquarian as well. And so I just kind of leave it off by saying, you know, regardless if the age of Aquarius is in full swing or has yet to come, I know there's lots of debate about all of that stuff. I'm not the person to answer that, honestly. Uh, but whether it's here or not, the Kumela really personifies so many things in Aquarius that it's, it's kind of hard to ignore. And so I wanted to show you this slide, which you guys have seen. So they have the snake wrapped around the mountain. This mountain is symbolic of that central axis of the sacred center. And as they're churning this mountain, they create the nectar of the gods, which supposedly brings you immortality. So this is another variation of it, sacred center. Just another illustration. And then these are the four river locations where Vishnu's eagle dropped the nectar. And so this is where they go between every four years or every three years. And then I thought this was really cool. This is actually, uh, this is awesome, but it's an eagle flying over India, dropping the, those droplets, right? The nectar. So what they really have is a rotating sacred center, which I think is kind of brilliant actually. So instead of it being this one central location, like I kind of was going on about earlier, they actually have four rotating sacred centers. So if any one of these locations somehow got destroyed or was unavailable or was conquered, it doesn't stop them from having the celebration and it doesn't stop them from gathering and having this sacred location, which I think is amazing, which kind of reminds me of decentralization, right? And so uh, I think that's really cool. It's like decentralization on a spiritual level sort of thing. Conclusion, in conclusion. So that's what I got, guys. Uh, but man, there's so many things I want to say in conclusion um, here. But essentially, I, I really think that at the heart of it, you know, I'm always presenting these correspondences. And I have a lot to say regarding this Northern symbolism, the Holy Grail, sacred center, everything else, but it really comes back to self. It comes back to the knowledge of self. You know, everything that I'm pointing out here, really, um, I kind of look at it as like a mirror of sorts. And so I'm looking at different aspects of myself, you know, and I think that the journey to your sacred center is, uh, is something that should be taken seriously. And just when you think you've uncovered, uh, you know, multiple layers, there's still other layers, you know, to be pulled off and what have you. So I think that we live in a nested system of sorts of nested vessels, you know, whether you want to call it spheres, you know, a lot of uh, alchemists believe that we lived um, within spheres, within spheres, within spheres, or if you want to look at it as eggs, or if you want to look at it in any other way, I think there's multiple ways to kind of look at it and consider it. Um, but I think that we pretty much are, um, you know, paralleling that dynamic. And so there's more to all of us. And uh, I encourage anyone to find their true north and their sacred center. And hopefully you guys enjoyed this presentation. I see that we have more time left people any questions or whatnot please let me know I'm, I'm have a discussion and that'll do it if you enjoyed this presentation i've linked a couple of others in the description you can also find me on social media under the following names link to those accounts can be found in the description as well or you can find them at symbolicstudies.com if you'd like to support the channel i do have a patreon that's patreon.com slash symbolic studies and last but not least i'm also available for tarot readings and study sessions you can text me at 503-893-4606 or contact me through my site. Thanks for watching. Take care.